Aaron and Bob, we had a wonderful call earlier this week starting to talk about water and you enthralled us and blew our minds away with some of the facts really about water. And so we'd like to start by asking you as, as we did last time to talk about our drinking water in the developed world and our municipal water and our well water and the, the areas of, of uh, knowledge that you have that we, sh we should know about so we first started talking about municipal water and about the different waters and the different times of year of water. Bob, could you start sharing some of your insights there? Sure. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Bocock, and, and I come from the municipal uh, drinking water field. Um, I began my career the same year as the Safe Drinking Water Act was promulgated by the US EPA in 1979, reading water meters on roller skates in Southern California. Uh, that, that parlayed me an opportunity to uh, become a, a water quality uh, engineer with the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the largest drinking water utility in the, in the world. Um, and then uh, ultimately a utility director and public works director. In 1997, um, I branched out and began doing consulting work uh, for, for companies in all 50 states, Canada and Mexico. Ultimately, that's taking me on to an international practice. In uh, uh, the late 1990s, uh, I had the opportunity to meet Ms. Erin Brockovich uh, through the attorneys. Uh, I, I serve as the water master for the LA Superior Court here in Los Angeles County, as well as the Superior Court in San Bernardino County for the Chino Basin Water Master. That's actually a judicial branch of government appointed by the courts. Uh, to oversee groundwater adjudications and surface water management in Southern in California. That's how it's done. Um, so meeting Aaron, it, uh, it parlayed me the opportunity to work in uh, problem solving, I guess is the best way to talk about it. Um, Aaron and I have the opportunity. Aaron was showing a picture to Stuart earlier this morning of a, a condition that's occurring right now in a, in a municipality. Not less than 50 municipalities in the United States of America in 2021 email Aaron literally showing that they're putting their children in in baths full of black water from manganese contamination, red water from iron contamination. And people think, wow, these are really, really, you know, simple contaminants that we should be dealing with in 2021. But there we go. That's that's water and, and sulfur uh, in basically in in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, which is, is a larger metropolitan area. This is not backwoods stuff here. This isn't a private drinking water well. That's a municipal corporation serving water to over 25,000 people. So um, like I said, we get 50 of those from community drinking water systems a week. Um, and, you know, because Aaron's, you know, in tow, uh, there's always this fear factor. Oh, they're coming to sue us. We're in all kinds of trouble. But in reality, um, for the, over the last 10 years, Aaron and I have tried to help community drinking water systems um, and communities that are on their own wells. So you, you're, most of your metropolitan areas have community drinking water systems that, that produce water either from surface water sources, groundwater sources, um, or a combination of both, or they, they buy water from large cities or metropolitan water districts, as I was discussing earlier. Um, everyone would like to think that, that water is uh, completely safe to drink in every corner of the United States of America. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. And that includes the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the city of New York, the city of Chicago. Uh, you, you name a major metropolitan area and we can begin discussing a lot of not only the historic contamination that they've, they've been encountering, but the emerging contaminants. I saw where Stuart mentioned the 374 water and, and their challenge with the perfluorinated, the PFAS compounds, the scotch guards, the firefighting foams, the, uh, the Teflons that are starting to become emerging contaminants. Um, what people fail to recognize is the definition difference between what is Safe Drinking Water Act and what is regulatory compliant water. To be compliant with the Safe Drinking Water Act, anyone can do. Um, it's called creative sampling. In some instances, it's called pencil whipping the paper. Uh, you write down what you think is compliant and all of a sudden you are in fact in compliance. So there's not only a lot of cheating, but there's also you know, creative sampling, 
flush for a little while, take the sample at selective locations, things like that. Um, quite frankly, you know, we're in a, we're in a, um, a major paradigm shift, um, not only in North America, but around the world with, with infrastructure that's completely decayed. What's happened in the United States of America is the unintended consequences of simultaneous compliance with regulations that had good intentions that were basically lines in the sand that said, if this is the new rule, this is the new regulation, great. This is how we get around it. And so we have the surface water treatment uh, uh, rule that was promulgated under the Clinton administration that led to problems with the disinfection byproducts rule that led to problems with the lead and copper rule. There was not lead contamination in the city of Flint, Michigan. Um, there was lead leaching from the infrastructure when the water quality changed. Water quality changes in every major city, every, every suburb and every small town in North America by seasons. Water quality is different in the fall, different in the winter, different in the spring, different in the summer. There are community drinking water systems that have water quality shifts between supplemental groundwater and surface water. Through the winter and the fall, we have systems that are pretty much all surface water that bring their own varying types of contaminants that as spring and summer come in and water use goes up, not only are we impacted by the agricultural discharge of nitrogen, phosphate, atrazine, and, and, and uh, glyphosate roundup, that make their way into our surface water sources, but we start turning on wells to supplement that, which have varying water quality characteristics that shift. And, and as the water shifts through the distribution system, it will cause disruption that release Legionella bacteria into our drinking water supplies, that will release lead and copper uh, uh, from the plumbing, that will cause a disruption mm -hmm. in the pipes thereby releasing all the tuberculation, the precipitated iron and manganese. That's what causes these red water disruptions. In all this chaos that is simultaneous compliance with regulations that were all you know, basically adopted in silos rather than homogenized, what happens is, is we actually have horrific practices in North America called free chlorine burns. We actually turn off ammonia that has no place in drinking water turn up chlorine in order to blast out nitrification in our drinking water distribution systems. Where does all that, that biology, that sludge, that buildup of tuberculation go? Our dishwashers, our laundry machines, our hot water heaters, our showers. We were talking with Stuart earlier in the week, uh, Aaron and I, and, and we've coined the phrase, the September baby. A September baby in North America is a baby that's born at the end of a third trimester in September, after a 90 day free chlorine burn that causes trihalomethane, a disinfection byproduct class of chemicals to increase in our drinking water supply. All drinking water regulations in North America are based on two liters of drinking water for a 40 year old white working male that he consumes. Do you know that you can inhale in a 15 minute shower disinfection byproducts? In a 15 minute shower, you can inhale more of those compounds into your bloodstream than you could drink in 90 days. The inhalation of trihalomethane in our drinking water supplies in major cities across the United States, that inhalation factor, um, you know, it's, it's something that's, that's basically causing uh, first trimester increase in spontaneous abortions, miscarriages, low birth weight in the second and third trimester, and a September baby reminds me of a group of fathers calling Aaron and I from Tyler, Texas, where they were feeding 10 milligrams per liter. The average swimming pool has two. 10 milligrams per liter in the drinking water supply to burn out the nitrification caused from the, the, the misapplication of ammonia into a distribution system. And they were all calling from the neonatal care unit in September because they turned the ammonia off on the 4th of July weekend burned the system out and all those babies were prematurely born with low birth weights in September in Tyler, Texas. This happens in all major cities that are impacted by disinfection byproduct rule and compliance with the cheap easy solution of just feeding ammonia as a supplement to sequester the chemical reactions that form disinfection byproducts. So there you go, Stuart. I kind of <laughs> gave you a whole well, 
think about to fire up those questions. Yeah, well, thank you, Bob, for um, really explaining a lot of facts about water that we don't know as consumers. And while we don't wanna scare all of us to say, oh my goodness, don't drink your tap water. We do wanna help understand what's in it, what you can do as a consumer, and then what choices do you have? Could you, you weigh in and, and you know, you being the consumer advocate and activist about water, we were talking about well water and about the, the risks of well water. Reed, was that for me or for Aaron? I thought you were. Aaron. Aaron. Oh, well, it, it's for Bob and I both. I mean, yes. from the perspective of, you know, my work is basically just being loud, <laughs> you know, I'm always glad when Bob is on because he's very calm. He can explain it all, which is really important because we take it for granted and we just assume that we have this luxury, you know, and there's many countries that don't to turn on the tap and have water, that everything is safe. And I'm always loving it when Bob is speaking and I was watching some of the questions come in like I do the people because they're really learning something. Oh my gosh, you know, water's never a soundbite. It's always a story. It is so unique. And, I, and when I listen to Bob talking about how water reacts, I sometimes giggle because I'm like, oh, it's moody like I am because water reacts. And um, well water is something that's off the grid. And, you know, we can get into our distribution systems from point A to B, the hundreds of miles of lines of distribution that's unregulated that we don't know what's going on. And that's the same thing that happens with well water. And it's, it's, just, it's off the grid and it's up to the homeowner to do all the testing. Oftentimes they think when states and agencies come out, they've tested the water that everything's fine. They're really just looking for E. coli and bacteria like that. And, um, it's just a lot of dangers lurk there. Uh, Hinkley, California, that resulted in the film Aaron Brockovich was well water. Some of our highest concentrations and most significant contaminated sites are often well water. So we've got what, Bob, 40 million Americans in the US still on well water. Yeah, and it, and it will be for many, many decades in the future. And it can really tell us what's going on in those aquifers because they're drawing from the aquifers. As Bob was sharing with you, you know, oftentimes we get surface waters coming in, but well waters are generally, uh, they're always pulling from an aquifer and it, it, we, we find horrible contaminations within these aquifers. And, and that for me is a super big problem. Um, you get these Denapples and these massive amounts of contamination that over decades can just, you know, burp it off and burp it off. And depending on what the water table is at, um, you can just suddenly find these huge sludge of, of contaminants moving through. So well water is, again, off the grid. People forget about it um, because they can't see what's going on. You know, when I show a picture to you like that, when we get photos like that and we get them every day, we have an entire collage of the United States of America. We're visual, people see it and they'll respond to that. But oftentimes they can't see those things coming from their well water. And by the way, uh, in Hinkley, they just thought that that was a natural element that was coming through the rocks and through the aquifer at, out of their wells. And that's why their water was green. And so, the, they tend to maybe pass things off a little more uh, with well water, but that's where real danger lurks. If you're a consumer on well water, Stuart, just real quick to follow up on where Aaron's at. Um, if you're on a well, you're probably on a septic mm -hmm. tank. And that's where this vicious cycle goes. Your septic tank is actually, you know, contaminating your groundwater well. You know, it was one thing when, you know, you had a farm out in the woods and you had a well over here and your septic tank over there. But now, even in the in the uh, suburbs where all these people are on wells and septic tanks, the state of Florida, you know, today's rain is tomorrow's drinking water, and they're all on wells and septic tanks, and and they they basically are repolluting themselves every day. So, what do we do as consumers to be able to one 
either test our well water or two, to work with state or, or local or government agencies to whether it's regulate this or to protect that, that well water. Oh, we talk about that often. I mean, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong here. Didn't the, the Los Angeles Municipal Water District lose their backup aquifer water because it's so polluted? Yes. Yeah, they basically are doing groundwater storage and recovery programs in the Central Valley of California for the bigger cities, LA and San Diego. And uh, it's contaminated with agriculture uh, pesticides, you know, one, two, three TCP, uh, a number of other contaminants. So they're going to actually have to you know, they spent billions of dollars putting water in the ground. Now they're going to have to spend billions of dollars taking it back out for supplemental water because it's contaminated. Um, to Stuart's question on, on what we can do, um, it's complex. It's very complex. There's, you know, at the consumer level, I think the best message that we can deliver is educate yourselves. Um, you know, a consumer confidence report isn't worth the paper it's written on. Um, they're actually, you know, just re from 1999. Um, they don't tell you anything new. They're kind of garbage. Um, so you need to understand what your source water is for your, if you're on a community drinking water system or understand your aquifer if you're on a groundwater well. In understanding your source water, then you can better apply treatment technologies. Okay, people that get on the phone and just decide mm -hmm. it's time to go buy a, a home water treatment system. No two home water treatment systems will treat any you know, water quality. All source water quality is different everywhere in this country. And so with knowledge, you can start making the right decisions and beware of seasonality. I mean, somebody said, you know, I drink water in my town. I'm in a suburb of Los Angeles, Claremont, California, where the Claremont colleges are. And in my town, I drink water in the winter and certain amount in the spring. And then I know when I'm on lake water because it smells, it tastes terrible, and I know it's full of all kinds of contaminants. So I actually know when to drink my water and when not to drink my water. And then I know to apply certain treatment when the water quality changes. So, so consumers just think, hey, there's no violations. My water's regulatory compliant. I'm safe. Nothing could be further from the truth. So... <laughs> Great, great news for us as, as consumers. We just need to become educated first and foremost. And we need to take whatever action we can to talk with our, our local water sources to ask questions of them and ask them, are, are you testing for glyphosate and PFAs and, and other contaminants, which normal consumers don't have any idea about? Let's jump to bottled water. And, and let's talk about the, the uh, facts and uh, truths and maybe fallacies there, Aaron and Bob. Well, you know, um, it's basically just filtered reverse osmosis water uh, bottled and packaged for convenience. I mean, I've found myself in many a situation where I, I need a bottle of water. Bob and I have been in many sites where municipalities have gone down for weeks, if not months at a time. And, and it becomes, you know, something that people are going to need. That's, that's how we get them a source of water. So from drinking, I mean, I found myself, there's certain places in the world I won't drink bottled water because, you know, the minute you open it up, you can smell that something's wrong. But typically it's reverse osmosis water. And so it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, yeah, it, you know. it's, it's the same thing as community drinking water systems mm -hmm. all around the country. Make yourself aware of what you're going into. Um, and, and it's the same thing with bottled water. Some are from natural spring sources that are perfectly fine, protected aquifers, protected springs, um, and they're, they're brand specific and they're source specific. Um, a lot of the brands have spun off and, and you're not exactly getting what it says on the label anymore. You need to you know, read behind the label to find out exactly what's going on. And Aaron's perfectly correct. Um, the, the drinking water market, you know, the, the, the hotel brands, the casino brands, the private label brands, they're, they're municipal water that's gone through reverse osmosis, straight up. Uh, you know, it, there's all kinds of sources. And just like you have to with the, the community drinking water systems, with bottled water, you need to understand its source. Well, and can, do you think we can trust what they're saying is true on, on the bottled water from the source? Um, I will tell you this, um, the bottled water 
is, is managed by the FDA, the, the Food and Drug Administration. And the drinking water is managed by the Safe Drinking Water Act and the EPA. And there's 50 states and 50 states have their own program. Half are run by Department of Health, half are run by Department of Environmental Protection. Department of Environmental Protections are engineers, Department of Health are medical doctors. I will submit to you that medical doctors and engineers do not have the same brain. One's left brain, one's right brain. And I will tell you that, 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 that uh, the application of those regulations is, is 50 states. The difference with the bottled water market, it is one federally managed program. And if they mislabel, they will get sued into the next century. And so they're very careful about how they label things. So the trust issue on their label is a whole lot better. Now, what contaminants are in that water is another story. And what they test for is another story. It is not, it is the, the testing requirements for community drinking water and the testing requirements for bottled water are, are very different. And that just shows how stupid we are as a federal government of regulatory agencies. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. I want to ask one more broad question, then I want to bring this into our community and the well for uh, people to come in. We've had a lot of questions in the chat, but I'd, I'd like to have everyone mm -hmm. chime in, engage, whether it's questions or thoughts that you have. Before we do that, I want to talk about plastics and the plastics in water, the, the nano microplastics that are in water. Can you share with us that concern and what health concerns there are there and what we can do about that? Well, California is actually the first state to regulate them. I went through the regulatory process and I'm very familiar with it. Um, they are a real problem. There are microplastics in every beverage you consume. Um, and it's just a question of what the health effects are. There are absolutely no good studies out there about the health effects of the plastics. Um, will they pass through the body? Do they retain themselves in our our, our body's filters, do they stick in the kidneys? Do they stick in the liver? Where do they end up? Do they, do they transmit in our bloodstream? Um, there are a ton of studies going on right now and the actual health effects of that are unknown. Now the chemicals that are added, you remember BPA that was added to you know, baby pacifiers, baby bottles, those were carcinogenic compounds within the matrix of the plastic. The big concern that we're hearing about plastics in water now are actually the micro shavings that you don't see that come off of our clothing. You put this in the laundry, I go swimming with a brand new pair of swimming trunks, microplastics find their way into the structures of, of all fish and mammals. And they're, they're quite frankly everywhere. We just don't know what they're causing. So should we just swim naked, Bob? Maybe. <laughs> 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 just shed the clothes so Aaron what as a consumer, what water should we be drinking what is the right thing to do how, sh how should we be bringing water to our homes whether it's in our home or whether it's bringing it to our home to be healthy for our families well, that's where we're having a real wake up moment. So my book, Superman's Not Coming, it is about our national water crisis. But here's the message it's about what we the people can do about it. And that is about informing yourself. And I have, you know, I can get real fired up and frustrated when I get in these communities and um, there's whether they've got, you know, um, trihalomethanes that are a problem, chloramines that are a problem, um, well water and they've been poisoned, is they amaze me and they operate from a place that I understand really well. Uh, I was born and raised in the Midwest. I've got an extremely keen common sense. I'm really rooted in it. I'm connected to it. And I'll tell you 10 times out of 10, every community we get in, there's one in there. It's usually a mom but that's what she's going to go with. And they're never wrong. And then when they realize that they thought something had their back, that we have all these oversights, we have federal oversights, we have state oversights, we have department of health, we have, you know, local council that the word didn't get down to them. They turn inward and they become very, um, observant and conscientious. So it doesn't take much for them to notice very quickly a smell in the water, what's going on. You know, again, back to the photos, they're all like, wait, wait a minute, what's going on? And they start to come from that place and then they start to join each other. 
So I take real comfort when I'm in with the communities because they know their problem is somebody is always telling them, oh, well, it's safe. It's within this level. And, and they just get to the point where they're not they're not going to buy it anymore. You know, and we share stories like this throughout the book um, with people in Tyler, Texas, and the mothers of Hannibal, Missouri, the mothers of Flint, Michigan. They've got that second gut. Science backs me up here. Your second brain. And they're like, mm -mm. they just stay with it. And that is one thing. Knowledge is power. And stay with that intuition. That is one of the, the immediate first protections and defenses that we have that I see communities operating with, and they're really starting to wake up and rise up to that. Uh, I showed you that dirty water photo to, uh, this morning, and that's from Sulphur, Louisiana. Let me tell you what, they've been on their game, and they're now they're collectively getting together, and they're getting stronger and stronger. So there's great power in these groups, um, and you'll lose them on the science. I, I've I've learned this in, in Hinkley, and this has been an important message. They, they pull away from us. You know, I was uh, one of the first times I worked with Bob, we were in a big community meeting and he was talking about organic matter and trihalomethanes. And I could see people's faces just kind of go white. They're like, okay, this is medical science. You know, I can't do that. And I asked Bob, what is organic matter? Well, it's dirt. So see, then something came on for them. They're like, okay, now I get this. And you don't have to, and this is the biggest message I want people to understand, have to have a science degree or a medical degree to understand water and to be involved with water and learn how to begin to protect yourself. And that becomes through your own knowledge and just simply be a human. And, and this is what exists at its simplest form. When, you know when water smells different, when water's green or yellow, it goes back to you don't eat the yellow snow, right? I mean, just don't drink it. And I get frustrated in the argument on five parts per billion versus four parts per billion because it's a poison and you're not supposed to drink it, frankly, at any level. We've been hung up here in the state of California on Chrome 6 for that very reason. But my work really is with the people getting back to believing and trusting in themselves and what it is that they are seeing, experiencing, and drinking. And I'll tell you when they do, they're never wrong, but that's where they can begin to, to make the first set of changes. And it's as easy as asking questions, um, not being afraid to ask questions, pick up the phone and make a phone call. And don't assume that that's being done for you. So it's it's real people empowerment and waking up to the fact that we're going to have to be involved and a huge part of making that change. And that is consistency and following through. And I will tell you everywhere we work in this country, what gives me hope every single time, it will be a mom, it will be a family member. Yes, it can be a dad that says, uh-uh. No, not this time. Something's not right. And they become activated. And then that changes everything. So it does take all of us being involved and being able to understand it. And all of us, you know, and Bob said it very well in the beginning. People often think when we come in, we're there for some lawsuit or work against you. No, we're not. Whether it is industry or a company or a municipality, big or small, or a politician or a leader or something, give us your hand. The only way we're going to solve this for the people, we have to work together. We have to be honest about what's happened, being transparent. We could beat everybody up and blame for everything that's gone on in the past. That's getting us nowhere. We are in that tipping point where we have to be together now to look for that solution in moving forward. We're here to help. And I'm really glad to be here today and everybody involved because we learn a lot from each other. And uh, I learned so much, it's fascinating. But the moment is the collectiveness that's going to shift the tide, if you will. Well, that's the, that is what we are seeking to create in the well 
is creating this collaboration and communities mm -hmm. to come together and whether it's water experts or it's just the person on the street to begin to really become educated and understand what's in our water. Because when we hear tap water is fine, we're unfortunately learning that a lot of the tap water is not fine and that it is the source of so much disease and illness that we have in our, our lives even in this developed world. So deep gratitude to you all and gratitude to the water and looking forward to our next time together. Great meeting everyone. Exciting. Thanks everybody. It was delightful. It was. Thanks.